a student in Palestine, member of any of the studential parties in the universities, is a crime. So what will Israel be without apartheid? It'll disappear just like South Africa did. Hello, my name is Stanley Heller. Welcome to The Struggle. The Struggle is shown in over 30 cable stations from Vermont to New York City on the internet at thestruggle.org, our YouTube channel, Struggle Video Media. We mentioned last week RPM, Revive the Peace Movement Network. Its website, rpm.world. It's defining issues center around Syria, Palestine, Black Lives Matter, and the climate crisis. RPM will be sponsoring a panel at the Left Forum in Manhattan on Saturday, May 21st at noon. It'll have Medea Benjamin, Nadal Batari, Ashley Smith, Dan Fisher, and myself. We hope to get video. One member of the network is Syrian Swiss uh, Joseph Daher. He's a columnist for PeaceNews.org. And I did a recent TV interview with him about his appearance on The Real News, where he disputed journalist Patrick Coburn. We also talked about those who are sympathetic to Syrian democracy, what they should be doing. I wanted to just briefly ask about uh, this interview uh, you did on The Real News, you were speaking, it wasn't exactly a debate, but uh, you and Patrick Coburn were uh, having a quite, uh, uh, you were saying quite different things. And, and one thing in particular uh, was about the hospital, uh, where the hospital that, uh, let's say, 55 people got killed, the, the last pediatrician in the uh, liberated area of Aleppo, and so on. And Coburn was saying, well, I don't know, they just indiscriminately shoot. And uh, I don't think you got a chance to answer that exactly. So what would you say about that hospital and so on? I believe, and uh, you're right, uh, there's quite some differences between uh, me and Patrick Coburn. I believe that, no, the, the strategy of the regime since day one in the revolution has been to prevent any kind of um, a dual power on the ground. In other words, a democratic altern alternative um, implementing a, um, an alternative society to the institutions of the regime. And by targeting hospitals, uh, but all other civilian infrastructures, the regime is targeting any possibility of, um, of a society that is able to live in Syria, not under uh, the occupation of the Assad regime. So this is why the Assad regime has been targeting hospitals in Aleppo, but other civilian infrastructures as well, but in other areas as well. You had, for example, uh, some civilian infrastructures also being uh, the target of Assad warplanes and Russian uh, warplanes as well in the countryside of Aleppo, in Idlib, and other areas of Syria. So. The strategy is very clear to prevent any kind of um, institutions alternative to the Assad regime and to push uh, population out of these areas of liberated areas to uh, prevent them of organizing by themselves. All right. So now we come to, you know, what should the, the, the left, the people who believe in uh, human rights in Syria, what should we be saying? Um, do we pick at the Russian embassy? Do, do we demand things from the U.S. government? Um, what, what are the things that could be helpful? There are many things that I think then can be helpful. Uh, first of all, on, um, on a direct perspective today, uh, it's participating in the, um, in the international campaign uh, in solidarity with Aleppo under the, the title Aleppo burning, so organizing demonstration in solidarity with Aleppo against the killing of any of all civilians, against the bombardments of the regime, Assad warplanes, but against also the shelling of civilians in uh, regime territories. Uh, we have to, to oppose uh, all of this. We have to oppose, obviously, the continuation of the Russian military intervention in Syria that did not stop at all. 
and the so-called withdrawal of Russia is a complete lie. Actually, the numbers of uh, Russian soldiers did not uh, decrease considerably. There's still 5,000 Russian military personnel within Syria. And the, um, the, 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 the campaign the, of bombing various areas of Syria have continued. Last example was Palmyra, but you have other areas also of Syria that have witnessed bombing of Russia. So therefore, obviously, as a leftist, we oppose any kind of uh, imperialist intervention. And this includes, obviously, Russia, which is a capitalist and imperialist state, uh, not only in Syria, but we can see it as well in Ukraine or the way they dealt with the Chechenia issue. Uh, also, we should uh, obviously oppose the intervention of uh, regional imperialist powers alongside the Assad regime, such as Iran, the Islamic Republic of Iran, that has been increasingly playing a sub-imperialist role in the region, whether in Syria or in Iraq and Lebanon, Yemen, etc. So therefore, we oppose it, obviously, just as the intervention of Hezbollah. In the same time, we should oppose as well other uh, interventions uh, coming from, for example, the so-called friends of Syria that are not at all friends of Syria, such as Saudi Arabia, Turkey, uh, and Qatar. We should ask the delivery of weapons only uh, without any kind of political conditions, but to the political groups such um, uh, in, within the Free Syrian Army with a democratic uh, political programs that exist in the plus the Turkish intervention against um, the bombing of uh, Kurdish areas should be opposed as well. So this, I think, and first of all, as leftists and progressive, put our energy in supporting the Democrats within Syria, supporting the local popular councils. They are the future of Syria. They See the full interview on our YouTube channel. This morning, May 13th, I was delighted to see Yasser Munif on Democracy Now!, He's a Syrian and a professor at Emerson College, and he talked about popular struggles in Syria, both against the regime and against the, the jihadi forces. He took to task Seymour Hirsch and Robert Fisk and others who are objectively supporting the Assad regime and Russian intervention. I've spoken with Munif several times, the last interview in April. You can see that one too on our YouTube channel. Speaking of the Left Forum in New York, I'll be chairing a second panel. It's called The Saudi Regime and Its Victims. It'll feature renowned Saudi dissident Ali Al Ahmed and Yemeni American Walid Fidama. That's going to be on Sunday in the late afternoon at the Left Forum. Now Sahar Francis, a Palestinian lawyer and general director of Adamir, Prisoner Support and Human Rights Association. She talks about how things have gotten worse since last October and the mistreatment of children prisoners. Yes, children prisoners of Israeli apartheid. Hello, and thanks a lot for having this event. It's really a pleasure to see all the young and the old generation coming to hear our story about the Palestinian political prisoners. As David and Beth were saying, actually the imprisonment uh, issue is very essential in the Palestinian context because there's no one single house that they didn't were affected all these years by this experience. In some place, like in some families, you would find more than one person in one current moment in the same time in uh, uh, prison. And actually more than 750,000 Palestinians since the beginning of the occupation till today were at least experiencing imprisonment once in their life. So this is why it's a very important uh, issue and it's part of the daily life. And the Israeli uh, occupation authority actually were using the imprisonment 
as a kind of uh, a way of control and oppression on the whole society because it's not about punishing people for bad things that they did. If you think about the whole uh, structure of the military court system with the military order system that controls the whole uh, life of the Palestinians since 67 till today, it was shaped in a way that it's interfering in every element of our life, illegalizing every activity, political activity or struggle against this occupation. And by this, they were arresting hundreds of thousands in order to undermine our struggle for the self-determination in the last 50 years. So today I would be, it's very hard to get in uh, uh, much details, legal details about what's going on in the uh, military court. So I would be brief on the level of more legal details, but just to describe the conditions of these prisoners and their families and the deterioration in the situation uh, since October, because every time there is uh, uh, tension or any conflict that raising, the Israelis would use more and more the imprisonment in order to oppress. So you can imagine how many more people were arrested in the last few months, more than 3,000 actually in the, uh, since the beginning of October. So currently there are 7,000 Palestinian prisoners in the Israeli prisons. Of course, Israel back in 95 moved all the Palestinian prisoners from the occupied territories to inside Israel. So now they are located in prisons inside the state of Israel. So in order to control the whole life of these people by enforcing restrictions on the family visits and the lawyers' visits and the relation between them and their uh, communities in the occupied territories. Out of these 7,000, there's uh, uh, 70 women that they are under detention and uh, around 430 uh, juveniles. There is still uh, six, seven Palestinian Legislative Council members that they are under detention and more than 760 administrative detainees. You know, Israel is using administrative detention, detaining people without any charges, without any clear evidences, just sending them based on secret information <coughs> for a, a different period. It could be one month up to uh, six months, and they can renew it indefinitely. And they use the administrative detention against everyone, including children. So currently we have around seven, eight children that they are subjected for administrative detention. It could vary between three months up to six months, and they can spend years over years without even knowing the, uh, uh, the reason for their detention and what they are supposed to do legally in order to be released. And also in the current period, for the first time, Israel used administrative detention against children in East Jerusalem. Since the beginning of the occupation, they were never practicing administrative detention against juveniles in Jerusalem. In the current trade, they arrested more than five children in Jerusalem, claiming that they are threatening. The main claim in administrative detention actually would be that you are a threat to the security. And sometimes activism in, in Facebook or in any of the social media would be this reason of threatening the security state of Israel in order to justify arresting a kid, 16 years old boy or girl in administrative detention for six months or three months. Uh, as I said, all these prisoners are held inside uh, Israel in different prisons. They are distributed in all uh, the country. Sometimes people from the north, they just send them uh, uh, to prisons in the south in order to make it more difficult for the families to obtain the uh, family visit. The journey sometimes can take 10 hours, 14 hours for the family in order just to meet their beloved for 40 minutes. Of course, these detainees face lots of torture, ill treatment, degrading treatment from the first moment of the arrest all the way along the interrogation in the court procedures and uh, uh, also in the prison when they are sitting their sentences they would be subjected for different methods of ill treatment and torture psychological torture like the solitary confinement. They use a lot the punishment of solitary confinement beside the long sentences that these detainees uh, uh, face. And of course, sometimes it's 
banning family visits totally or banning a lawyer visit or they uh, don't offer them proper health treatment in proper uh, uh, time. They uh, also use the issue of fines that whenever they claim you committed a violation inside the prison, irrelevant to your sentence, they can fine you, like uh, uh, punish you by paying fines to the system. So actually there is an element of exploitation, a, a, a economical aspect that the Israeli prison system is using in this issue by enforcing these prisoners to pay these fines and sometimes to enforce them Actually, in most of the times, they enforce them to buy their food because they don't offer sufficient food or uh, uh, neither in quantity or in quality. So most of the prisoners end up having supplements from the canteen with high prices, shoes, uh, clothes, and all these needs. They uh, are enforced to buy uh, from the canteen uh, in the prison. So it's not the heavy, very, like, stuff for the Israelis to have these thousands of Palestinian prisoners, they are benefiting at the end of the day from the system, uh, uh, from these prisoners. The same in the military court system. Like, we have just two military courts in the occupied territories, one in the north and one near Ramallah for the center and the south. And these military courts every year review more than 5,000 files. Imagine two courts with maximum 14 permanent judges that they can review this amount of files every year. Some, some cases don't take more than two minutes or three minutes to extend the, center, the, the detention of these uh, uh, detainees and to send them mostly in cases of throwing stones where exhausting the procedures would be much longer than the period that you can ex expect in the sentence. It could be like four months, five months, and if you want to exhaust the evidences, it can take one year. So you rather prefer to do plea bargain. Most of the cases in the military court would end up in plea bargain because the Palestinian uh, detainees don't have trust in this military system. It's a very discriminating uh, uh, system. They cannot guarantee that they would be acquitted. Even if we as lawyers believe that they are innocent, it's very hard to argue the evidences. Most of the evidences would be the confessions of these prisoners that were taken under interrogation out of pressure and uh, torture. And it's very hard to prove in these military courts that the persons were tortured. It, usually it's the words of the interrogator versus the words of the detainee that he was tortured. These uh, interrogation sessions are never uh, videotaped like the Israeli criminal code request in criminal cases because they claim it's security cases so they don't tape them so we never know what's going on in the real time in these interrogation sessions. As lawyers, even with children cases, we are not allowed to be with the child in the interrogation session uh, as well. So imagine since 67 till today, there's more than 1,700 1, uh, military orders that they are interfering in all of our daily life. All the political parties in Palestine are still declared illegal 24 years after the Oslo agreement with the Palestinian Authority and still the, PL, the, the PLO, all the political parties under the PLO are declared illegal. So theoretically they can arrest uh, uh, Mahmoud Abbas himself because he's the head of the Fatih party and detain him for being a member in illegal organization. This is the most common, uh, I would say, uh, um, um, activity that they would be detaining people. When you say 7,000 people in prison, it doesn't mean that all these people were involved in militant activities, for example. The minority of them, not more than 500, are sentenced for life sentences because of militant activities. All the rest are political activists, social activists, students, 
being a student in Palestine, member of any of the studential parties in the universities is a crime because all these studential movements are declared illegal as well. They are associated with the political parties and this is a reason for being uh, imprisoned for one year, one year and a half. So any activity actually, even if it's the most peaceful activity, demonstrations, writing slogans, issuing newspapers is still illegal in the occupied territories and this is just like explains why we always have such high number of prisoners in the Israeli prisons. So since October till today there is new trends that were used by the Israeli occupation forces, mostly the uh, extrajudicial killing. They were always of course using these issues but what was alerting in these uh, uh, months, the easiest of using fatal for like uh, lethal uh, forces against people, anyone would be suspected and immediately the shooting would be in the upper uh, part of the body to kill. So it was clear that the police and the army and the settlers are using weapons in order to kill in the justification that these young people were involved either in throwing stones or stabbing or other activities. Not just uh, uh, killing the people, in most of the cases they were injuring them and leaving them to bleed for death without offering any proper health treatment in proper time. In some cases, they were also uh, uh, taking the bodies, not giving back the families the bodies to be buried in a respectful way. Till now, they still keep 15 bodies of, uh, mostly from Jerusalem. And we were enforced to go to the High Court to petition the High Court in order to get back uh, the bodies in uh, four days, actually. The High Court has to give the decision whether to interfere or not. Honestly, we don't trust that the Israeli High Court will interfere. They will use the security uh, justification to say that this is a political question. We cannot interfere. We cannot enforce the, uh, the state to get back. Because actually, the whole ministers, including the prime minister, were saying that in order to suppress the uprising, we have to be more tough. And this is one, uh, one of the tools that they are trying to use. And we say that this is collective punishment because it's against the families. The person is dead, that's it. You cannot punish anymore, but it's a punishment against the whole uh, families. They also refused to do investigation in all of these cases. We were petitioning the court to enforce the police to investigate in the circumstances of the killing they refused. And they refused to allow us to do autopsy as well in order to discover what was the reasons for the death in order to continue with the legal procedures. So I'm not so optimistic that in all of these 200 cases of the extrajudicial killings, we would be succeeding to prove that most of these cases were actually there was no need to shoot these people and you could rather polarize them by shooting on the feet or use force, other force, in order to control these uh, uh, people. The number of uh, uh, prisoners increased a lot. Before October, it used to be m less than 5,000. Now we have around 7,000. And there were lots who were uh, detained, but for a few months and released. So the estimated number in total since October till now is around 3,000 people that they were arrested. It included children, of course, women, uh, uh, political activists, journalists. Currently, there's uh, around 16 Palestinian journalists that they are arrested and mostly under administrative detention or accused of incitement. This is, would be the main general accusation against journalists, like instead of respecting the freedom of speech and uh, public opinion uh, uh, issues, they claim that they are inciting for more violence in the occupied uh, territories. I think I would uh, uh, stop here and like let's keep more time for um, uh, discussion because I think it's very important to discuss what uh, Beth was mentioning, how we can be more active and how we can support these issues by the different campaigns that we have, whether on the child uh, detention issue or against administrative detention or getting back the bodies if the High Court really decides uh, not to return the bodies. I think the 
public pressure coming from the grassroots movements all over the world would be the most supportive thing for us struggling on the ground because unfortunately on the political level it's so depressing to see how the UN different bodies or mechanisms is failing actually to guarantee justice and human rights for the Palestinian people. Thank you. I want to mention threats and restrictions against this man, Palestinian Omar Barkouti. Barkouti lives in Akka and is a leader of the BDS movement, boycotts, divestments, and sanctions against Israeli apartheid. He was threatened by an Israeli government minister named Yisrael Katz, who called upon Israel to engage in targeted civil elimination of BDS leaders. The words are vague, but they clearly hint at assassination. This last week, the Israeli government announced it would forbid Barghouti from leaving Palestine, Israel, even though he has not been convicted of any offense. Jewish Voice for Peace has started a online campaign to get 20,000 people to petition Secretary of State Kerry to pressure Israel into restoring Barghouti's right to travel. We've linked to it on our website, The Struggle. And to show the Israeli government we have a sense of humor, the latest from Apartheid adventures. Running scared? Apartheid adventures. Fun filled vacations in Israel is keeping your apartheid safe. Those 50 laws discriminating in your favor, your special laws and privileges, your soldiers in prisons to keep others under control, the whole system that says you're special if you're of the correct ethnic religious category, we will defend it from the threat of those evil villains of BDS. Boycott, divestment, and sanctions. They're everywhere, all over the world. They're multiplying and they are against you feeling special. They're against apartheid. And let's face it, if you're against apartheid, you're against Israel. Because what will Israel be without apartheid? It'll disappear just like South Africa did. Those BDS villains are costing us millions of dollars already. But don't you worry. Just because more and more people everywhere are joining the movement to boycott Israel until apartheid is over and everyone has equal rights because apartheid means ignoring the majority of people and going straight to the real bosses, governments, and corporations. Not power to the people, power to the power. We're getting governments to pass laws, whether people want them or not, to make boycotting apartheid illegal. To say that criticizing the special system of laws and privileges that discriminate in favor of one ethnic religious category is the same as criticizing that ethnic religious category. That's right, criticizing apartheid is hate speech. We're making anti-apartheidism illegal. We've passed laws in France, Canada, and the U.S in Illinois, South Carolina, and other states. In fact, we're probably working on your state legislature right now. So if you're against apartheid, you're against the U.S. government, even though the U.S. government says settlements are illegal, but whatever. Now it's illegal to agree with the U.S. government that settlements are illegal. Okay, we can't precisely make it illegal because of that pesky free speech thing in the Constitution, whatever, but we can make it illegal to give government funding to anyone who talks about boycotting apartheid. And in a modern democracy like Israel or the US, that's how censorship works. Withhold public funding. If they talk about boycotting apartheid, the government will boycott them because boycotting is a great thing if we're doing it. We've already gotten people to destroy books that we don't like. We've got whole agencies of agents surveilling you and don't make us resort to what we call civil elimination, which means you disappear, but in a politically acceptable way. Israel is spending millions of dollars on this campaign by the time we're done, brand Israel will be as invincible as brand Disney, and we won't have to worry about silly free speech laws. So have no fear. Apartheid will take care of you, and take care of you good. Apartheid Adventures, leaving no freedom unchallenged. That's our program for today. See you next week at this time. I'm Stanley Heller for The Struggle.